Ah, Finale Liguri, home to amazing trails, unbelievable gelato, and of course, my favorite, the Piaggio Ape. But it's also home to one of the coolest mountain bike brands out there, Miss Spent Summers. Even if you haven't heard of them, you might have heard of some of their projects, like the Hurley Burley Downhill Book, and of course, the Tea and Biscuits video series. So then, whilst here in Finale, I thought I'd check out Miss Spent Summers' Finale workspace and learn more about this growing brand. Uh, so my name's James McKnight and I work for Miss Spent Summers, which is a media company um, and a brand thing is what we call it. So we're a little bit more than just mountain bike media. We do other stuff related to mountain biking as well. But media is the core of what we do. What we do in mountain biking is that we try and record the history of the sport. We're all just a group of mountain bikers who love the sport, love riding, love following the racing and all the pro riders and what they do. And we really just want to document that for other people to see and for ourselves to look back on in years to come. The name Miss Spent Summers, I was, along many moons ago, I was working on a book project called Miss Spent Summers, which was going to be about basically lifers in Morzine in the Alps. These people I'd met through doing this myself, being a bike bum basically, living for riding bikes, um, living in a van or slumming it in someone, the corner of someone's chalet in Morzine, whatever, doing everything that you can just so you can ride bikes for a couple of months uh, of the summer. And I was profiling these people and I called it Miss Spent Summers because that was what they were doing basically. And that's also where I guess my background in, in the whole Alpine scene especially comes from that I ended up bumming around working in crap jobs uh, building or cleaning hotels so I could ride bikes and that's kind of fundamental to to the company so it's a little bit of history and hopefully it's something that's adaptable to anything we do yeah I hope that's relatable I hope a lot of people out there are doing bike seasons or aspiring to or even just a week or two whatever you can manage to do in your summer well for start we're all like from a print background I think and then also we were looking for a medium that we can document all these races in that in 10 years time people can look back on each season of mountain bike events and remember what happened. On the internet there's, there's so much amazing stuff going out there. We, but we sort of thought that in 10 years time it's going to be difficult to find those stories. So we wanted to put them into one format that's future proof. And funnily enough, that was the kind of oldest technology, which is just a piece of paper with some ink on it. So we're not really against doing other, other types. So we do a little bit of video stuff and online content, but we think print is still, still has its place and uh, something's got to go on the coffee table. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be interested, in to, interested to hear what James said to this one. <laughs> But uh, it was when I was doing work experience at Dirt Magazine. He was living next door to Steve Jones. And so Ben grew up with this whole scene of mountain bikers uh, coming into the Dirt Magazine office. People who document the sport living around him. The office was just up the road from where he lived. I grew up reading Dirt Magazine and then I eventually started doing photo shoots for it and then doing articles for the magazine. At the age of 15, uh, I went to Bristol with Steve Jones. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's how we met. I, I was doing a photo shoot for a bike test, I think, and Ben came along as an assistant to the great Steve Jones. We went there and met James as he was a canine rider, I think, at the time. And he was, he was the rider on a photo shoot and we were doing a feature on Bristol. So that was the first time I met him. Knew each other from that and then became friends, worked together a lot. Um, done a lot of bike trips together, and then we eventually ended up starting a company. So Dirt Magazine in 2015 just sort of completely wound down and shuttered up. So I left a little bit of a gap in the mountain bike media sort of print world. And also at that point, 
a lot of people are sort of saying that Print's dead. Everyone keeps saying that sort of thing, which we, we hate saying Print's dead. We hate saying Print is not dead as well, because it's such a cliche. So then we were sort of doing a few like freelance projects together on the side. And then James, James initially started Miss Spent Summers um, and doing Hurley Burley. I was immediately just was like, well, I'm helping out and going to get involved. So, because it's a cool, cool project and a cool thing to be involved with. We didn't want to just say, oh, we need to keep dirt going, let's do a monthly magazine. It was kind of like at that point we were like, actually, you know, is there actually a market for that, a monthly magazine? Not sure, because there's so much good stuff online. But we still think there's a real space for a print thing. And like we said, I think the print medium is actually the best for recording the history of the sport. But it morphed into an annual. We thought once a year is actually kind of what people want and need. They don't need to be buying a magazine every month because there's so much good news and content out there. 2016 was the first downhill yearbook book, Hurley Burley. And like I said, it was a year after Dirt had really closed down. I was working freelance, doing writing and editing. Um, Chris Jones, who, was the, who had been the dirt designer at the end, he was doing similar freelance work. Um, ben was doing freelance photography and probably still studying at that point, I guess. And like I said, we really just wanted a book that recorded the downhill series from that year, because we thought if there's no dirt magazine, then there's no real print product recording the history of the downhill World Cup series at that point. So we did that for that very reason, that we just wanted that to exist. The first year of Hurley Burley was probably what you'd call fluid, <laughs> which means just completely winging it. I think I sort of started the ball rolling. Ben really helped me out just with editing down photos and bringing in all the content. But it was really a small team of me, uh, Chris Jones, who was designer that year, doing most of the sort of editorial work together in really condensed time frame because we had to do other work. We had to make it something that was actually viable as well to fit in around other work. I thought with a print product like that, we need to, it needs to be a long-term project. We thought online stuff, if it doesn't work instantly, you've probably done something wrong. With print stuff, it's kind of the opposite. It needs to have a base and you need to have a little bit of history, story and history behind it. So we thought five years of doing it part-time as a side project would be kind of a minimum for it to start really working as something that people know about and people are collecting. And that's pretty much what happened after five years of doing that as a real side project. It then sort of naturally became a bigger, bigger project and a company as well around it. The first year, it was, like I said, two to three of us with, and plus about 10 packs of coffee. That was kind of what got us through the first year of doing it. Um, and now, that was 2016, and now in 2023, we've got still really small team, five or six real fundamental people on the editorial team, which is design, commissions, editing, and kind of day-to-day -day running of the show, and then still three photographers. When we started off, it was really about producing a history book of the sport, but, and we're all massive fans of the racing, but we're not competitors ourselves. What we like to do is go out and mess around on bikes, and we wanted to represent that as well somehow, because that's what most people do, and that's what we really love. And that's what we really enjoy creating stories around as well, is just pure fun of riding bikes. So that's why we, once we'd built up this catalogue of yearbooks, of the Downhill and Enduro yearbooks, we'd got to a point where we could afford to actually create some other projects based around just pure bike riding. And that's where things like Spent have come in. Um, and then other stuff like videos that we've done online and um, newsletters and stuff like that is a spin-off of all of that stuff. We, as riders, we just love riding bikes for fun. And Tommy Caldwell, who does our Tea and Biscuits films, that's what he manages to just put across in all his videos, is just fun of riding bikes. So to be able to work with him on a video project was a kind of next step. And luckily he was up for doing that, and that's become, again, one of those sort of cornerstones of our company now is Tea and Biscuits as a little film series. 
um, sort of feature length films following pro racers and just total shredders messing around on bikes basically and hopefully inspiring people to do that as well just stop taking anything seriously not needing any of the best new equipment just go out and have fun and tear up some corners so to do that to be able to work on that with Tommy was total total dream scenario Team Biscuits is always meant to be a little trilogy so three films. Tommy's been working on Tim Biscuits 3 for a while now, and it's got, again, a long timeline for filming it. And it's gonna be the final in a trilogy and build up the kind of wild, fun, hype level, I think, <laughs> to that point. Right, so watch this space. Yeah, watch this space. We've changed the process, actually, over the last couple of years. Previously, we both had other freelance work that we would be doing throughout the season, and then we'd sit, sit down together and work on the books in quite a condensed period of time. But this year, especially, we've been working on everything throughout the season. So, like, as, as the races go, we've been doing some notes, newsletters, and, and that, that begins the whole process, really. We, that's, that's the starting point for the photo selecting um, and getting information for the features, um, captions, um, and we like, collate results as we go. So it's much more of an um, uh, ongoing process now. We have a group of people that we work with regularly, uh, contributors. Um, these are not necessarily writers, they're writers and like I said, uh, staff, uh, like team staff or uh, photographers. Uh, but we know that they're on site, that they know the scene very well, and um, so we just commission the stories through them. And for me, what was really cool uh, coming as an outsider, um, and especially when I was working on my first project, was I came in like really intimidated. You know, oh, I'm gonna, I don't know, interview Tracy Mosley or Jerome Clemens or uh, Sven Martin, and you know, finding out how, how cool, how chill they were, and how happy they were to talk to me about, you know, their stories, that was really, really cool. And then every time I need to interview somebody, even if it's Richie Rood or I don't know, or uh, Martin Mez or whoever, uh, they just, they reply quickly and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> you think, okay, I'm on, nobody knows me. I, I'm not part of the scene really. I mean, are they really gonna respond? And everyone comes through, it's really cool. And everyone's super happy to be on board. Once we get to almost final stages of the books. We get them completely printed out every page, put up on the wall in this room. And then we spend a few days just mulling them over, figuring out where there's kind of holes in the sort of storytelling in the photos. Um, riders who are missing, riders who have too many photos. So we do Hurly Burly Downhill book on one side of the wall, and then we do the World Stage Enduro World Cup book on the other side. Like I said, so we can sort of just sit in here, live it, soak it all up, and stuff jumps out at you straight away when you see it all in one like that, it's totally different to looking at a PDF on the computer. So when we're doing our sort of pondering, we'll sit here and we'll just slap post-it notes up every now and then when we see something that we want to swap around or a photo that doesn't really work alongside the one next to it. And like one of those notes says DPS, that's where we kind of like, you see it all as a wonder and you realise that sometimes you just need to pull these photos big. And it's always tempting to cram more stories in, but then actually sometimes you need an image to really breathe and have a little bit more impact like that. There's also, we just do these, like the swaps, swap spreads, and that's just because we think that this needs a bit of a better flow throughout. This is probably, because these are quite similar, so from last year, so we'll have swapped them, swapped those around. Throughout the year we get folders from the three photographers, which is Sven, Seb and Boris. This year we've got a few photos from Kike as well, and uh, on top of that, and we get probably 20,000 photos per photographer from the season from both, for both books. We, get, we narrow it down from maybe 20,000 photos per photographer to maybe 10 for each round. Um, so it's, there's probably about a million different combinations of images that we could use. I think in general we do try and, if there's a cool photo, we try and put it in, no matter if it's not a story. We have like a list of notes and important things that we think have happened throughout throughout that race or that weekend, and we try and couple that with the prettiest pictures. So we'll, we, it's a balance of trying to tell all the stories. It's kind of impossible to tell everything 
in. It's, we always wish we had another 100 pages <laughs> to tell all the stories. But yeah, yeah, we aim to try and tell the most important stories from each, each race. Yeah, I think something that we're proud of is that we made these yearbooks, these annuals about the sport, and through doing that, I think that's sort of inspired some brands and other people to do book projects as well. We brainstorm ideas, uh, but I start thinking about uh, commissioning the articles and about identifying people uh, to write them. And then I get in touch with people. And depending on the publication, either you know I propose our ideas or I talk with them just to develop the ideas or let them just, you know, provide their own input. So we've done, we, and luckily we've been involved in some of those. So recently we've done a book for SRAM about their Eagle transmission drivetrain. The way that we choose a format for each book, it's not just sort of, we don't pluck it out of the air. Like there's always a format that we think goes best with the style and the content and the story that you want to tell. Um, for SRAM, like this is already about product design, the whole story of the book. So we based the format, so the paper that we use and the size of the book. And we started with the outer circumference of the biggest cog on a Eagle cassette. And then we made this quick print project where we put together photos from a trip we did to their headquarters and some quotes that we got from some of their staff. Actually, we found out that we'd be much more efficient scaling it down by five millimeters so we can get the most out of sheets of paper at the printers and not waste any paper. And we thought that sort of stayed true to their ethos of everything having a reason behind it. So this actually ended up smaller than the, sorry, smaller than the dummy book we made, but the dummy book allowed us to sort of find out if we were really happy with this square format and how it would open. And yeah, we did a bit of a sneaky test of the print quality as well with this, where we um, made this print guide and basically if the printer didn't cut off the end of the arrow so that means they did a really good job of trimming the paper squarely and looks like it did a good job so it's all right. <laughs> it's funny with Miss Spent Summers we've it's been a little bit sort of trying a load of stuff and seeing what works and we started doing these newsletters from events um, in the last two years and we get loads of good feedback about those. So that's going to become more and more central to what we do and we really enjoy doing those because it's, as much as we love doing the print project, it's also really satisfying to work on something that we can put, publish straight away and it doesn't cost loads of money to do it. So and that's good fun, so we'll keep doing that. Um, and then in 2023, we did our first kind of big event, which was a pop-up store and a photo exhibition in Leger. That was really fun to do. Uh, it was really cool to see people and let them actually experience everything with us. Um, more events, I think, would be really cool to do. Uh, sort of, we've been sort of talking about that maybe like an immersive video exhibition-y room, so, something like that. I think would be it would be really exciting. Um, we had these coffee mornings going on early morning, really early mornings for racers and teams. And it just created a nice little hub for people to come and hang out at. And loads of the teams and racers said, we need this at more events to sort of bring everyone together. So it felt like we were actually doing something meaningful as well. So hopefully we'll do more of those if we can afford it. So we sell almost all our stuff um, in terms of numbers is sold on our website, which is misspentsummers.com. Um, we sell books, clothing, zines, and photo, like really nice quality photo prints on there, which I think is another, it's an outlet for photographers to sell some nice photos. Um, that's where most people can buy stuff. And then we also work with quite a lot of shops as well. So if you know a core, core bike shop that loves mountain bikes, our stuff's likely to be in there as well. And they can come to the finale, right? Or you can come to Finale Workspace in Finale Ligure and you can drop in, have a cup of tea, have a coffee, hang out, look at some photos and books and chat about bikes to us and we'd love you to do that. Thank you very much for coming to see us. It's been 
brilliant. And sorry, I've been really nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect.